Right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Victoria Moffat. Um, I know some of you have been before, but not, not all of you. Um, so I am the Founder and Managing Director of LexRex Communications Limited. LexRex is the PR consultancy aimed uh, at the legal sector. So I'm a former lawyer and I moved over, I'm not, I can never decide if I moved out of the dark side or into the dark side um, when I left the law and, and moved into PR. I'm joking, of course, neither of the dark side. Um, but yeah, so I've been running uh, Electrax Communications for nearly eight years. Uh, so these webinars uh, started, well, 14 weeks ago, I can hardly believe it, and um, today is our seventh, um, when lockdown started and we just sort of realised that Actually, for most law firms, uh, PR and marketing wasn't really top of the priority list. Uh, survival was. So the aim of these uh, webinars was to, to help law firms survive, in essence, by providing sort of useful and insightful content with, with our trusted partners. Um, so, yeah, this is the seventh uh, and penultimate um, of this series. And I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to introduce you to, uh, to Avita Patel, who is going to do an amazing session today. Um, I'm really excited. So over to you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so I am going to, uh, typically when we practice these things, work on it, there we go. Uh, hi, so my name is Advita and I own an internal communications and employee experience consultancy in Manchester um, called Comms Rebel. I am also um, the uh, I also sit on the board for the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, which is a professional membership for PR practitioners. And I also chair the internal communications uh, um, of, that, of that committee as well. Uh, I've worked in internal comms for around 15 years now in various in-house jobs. And it's only this year that I decided um, to take the leap and work for myself and set my own consultancy up because I wanted to support other organizations and businesses out there with their internal communication worries and employee experience questions and, and um, experiences that they might have. So um, today I'm going to talk about how to engage and empower your employees uh, once, they headed, once they've headed back into the workplace or if you've decided to um, work work majority of the time at home and how you can empower those colleagues to keep connected. We know that the last um, few months have been very difficult for many people. It's been a challenge and I think quite a few individuals have probably didn't anticipate the, the, the kind of level this crisis was going to take. Most crises, if you've been involved in any, generally end after a certain period of time. And I think it's quite evident that COVID-19 is going to be with us for a long, long time, um, especially um, as especially before we haven't even come up with a vaccine and the track and trace is taking a, a significant time to, to sort out as well. So. I always say to many of my clients and people in my network that this is a marathon and it's not a sprint. So it's really important to remember that, that this is, this is not a short term fix or so whatever you introduce into your business for your employees and, and stakeholders, it's, it's going to be a long term solution. And it's probably something that we need to consider when we're moving into the new world as well. Um, I don't think personal, uh, personally, I don't think that we will, ever go back to how things were pre-COVID. Uh, and it's about adjusting ourselves in, in what this means now in this new kind of environment that we have. I, I, I don't like the word new normal because I think it's, it's been something that's just a really awkward phrase, um, but it's been used so much out there at the moment that it's, it's if people relate to it. So for this, you know, for this kind of uh, webinar, I'm going to talk about the new normal, even though I do kind of dislike it, because I suppose the question is, do we want to go back to whatever normal was before? I think many of us have kind of realised um, from either working from home or, 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 or may have had family members or friends or acquaintances or colleagues impacted by COVID-19 that priorities have changed a little bit. And our colleagues will definitely be looking at the safety, well-being and mental health um, conversations that are taking place in the organization. We're not dealing with, uh, like I said before, an average crisis, whatever an average crisis is, to be honest. This is something that we um, has impacted people across the globe. 
uh, and it's definitely, you know, a lot of people have had to do a juggling act with things that are going on. So a lot of people have had to either homeschool, they've had to look after parents, they've had to look after their neighbours, some may be furloughed, have not, have not had to, work, have not been able to work. There's definitely conversations taking place around various redundancy programmes. People are anxious. There's lots going on. Um, and with so much noise in the in the world as well, with social media now, um, you know, around and everybody has access to it. If you talked about this 10 years ago, things like misinformation and fake news wouldn't even be considered entering our, our world. Uh, and sadly, though, that's the kind of environment that we live in now. Uh, and a lot of our colleagues and acquaintances and stakeholders will be online reading information. So this is why effective communications um, is really important and even more important to our employees because they are the ones who are our advocates and our champions of the work that we're doing in the organisation. Uh, and I would say whatever's reflected on the inside is, is definitely happening, you know, will we'll definitely transpire on the outside. So reputation management wise in how we are managing this crisis with our people, people are watching and they're listening and you would have seen yourselves on the news uh, and, and online where brands are being called out for poor behaviour. I think, you know, one of the classic examples is the Weatherspoons example and Richard Branson as well actually and Richard Branson was seen as this kind of top end leader you know an advocate for great good practice and looking after the people but even his stance on how to manage communications and, and the colleagues and what happens to them was what was commented on externally and I would say his brand and even his own reputation depleted uh, a little bit so as organizations we need to be really conscious of that and we need to be conscious that our employees also have access to technology that they didn't have before and it's quite easy for them to share what's happening internally now um, and, and you can put in as many policies and, and and things in place to say that this isn't you know you should be commenting about this you shouldn't comment about that but if they've left the organization there's really nothing stopping them talking about what happened and their experiences so I talk about um, post-isolation um, process. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh God, look at this. Uh, I talk about post-isolation um, progress under three pillars. So the three yeah. pillars I kind of talk about. So we just just before sorry, Victoria. We, no, no, don't be daft. I'm um, I'm being rude and butting in. Just before we um, just before we move on, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that you said that really resonated. And the first was yeah, of course. Uh, the, the first one was around um, this marathon, uh, you know, it's a marathon versus a sprint. And I know we talked about this yesterday and I know that you'll come on to this in, in, in more, more detail later. But obviously the people that we've got in the room, some of the people, well, most of the people we have in the room are, are, um, are obviously in sort of leadership positions. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on this point, like I say, that we talked about yesterday, which is that um, they will obviously be expected to be communicating with their staff and getting the messages right you know and leading from the front and, and all that sort of stuff which you would expect um but what do they need to be doing to making sure that to make sure that they're you know looking after themselves whilst leading from the front because i think that's quite an important yeah. point it's this is hard this isn't just hard for employees or just hard for you know people who are doing delivery or for fear and this is hard for everybody isn't it regardless of what your position is yeah yeah, without a doubt. And you know what? And that's a really good, valid point, because I think leaders, as leaders in an organisation, they're the often forgotten employees of the business, senior partners, leaders. Um, and it's and, and it's really important that they have the strength and we all have the strength actually to help and support our colleagues. So the way that when I speak to my senior directors and clients, it's about what are you doing for yourself to make sure that you have the headspace to have that conversation with your colleagues. So it could be things like having a coach or a mentor that you can lean on, not necessarily somebody in your organization, but somebody externally. So I've seen some cross mentoring work really successfully with other organizations where people are linking in with each other and connecting about the, what's going on in their in their organization and what challenges they're facing with their colleagues and having that space to talk because um, you'll be spending a lot of your time as leaders listening 
uh, and helping and supporting and advising and guiding. So you need to make sure that as a leader yourself, you've got that opportunity to talk and be heard as well. So I recommend with all my kind of senior directors that I work with and chief executives that make sure that you've, they've got a coach and they've got a mentor and they've got a network of people that they can lean on. So a lot of um, so a couple of organisations that I work with have set up uh, external um, sort of like circles where they can connect with each other on a monthly basis, where they can talk about in in a safe space. They can talk about challenges that they might be facing, conversations that they might be having, and somewhere where they can be vulnerable and they can put themselves out there a little bit and speak openly about the challenges that they may be facing personally as well as um, professionally. So having that space to be able to connect with somebody externally outside of your organization is, is important. But I would also say, you know, there's nothing wrong as a leader in an organization to speak openly about how you are feeling. I think a lot of your team would resonate with that and they would see that there's an actually underneath that leadership kind of behavior, there's a, there's a, a person just like them. And as employees, when you're reporting into your manager, I think you often forget that they're a human being and they have people at home and they've got families and they've also got pressures and things are happening in their lives. And I think when you open up about conversations with your teammates and have that really equal thought in terms of we're going to have an open, transparent conversation here, it really helps to kind of um, give you a bit of headspace. And people recognise that you are also trying your best and you're yeah. trying to help them as much as you can and asking those questions uh, right at the you know right at the top of that conversation you're having with your team to say look i know how you're feeling because i've got three kids or two you know i've got homeschooling too and i've got you know elderly parents right to look after and i'm anxious and i'm really worried about getting on public transport so what can we do together to make sure that we're working and coming up with an answer that we are well comfortable with um so it is about a two-way conversation and making sure that you have space to share and you also allow yourself to be a little bit more vulnerable with your colleagues as well yeah so i hope that helps and if any, you know if anybody has any specific questions around you know challenges that they might be facing on how they can establish that kind of relationship with people in the business then please just you know do use the q a facility and we can we can answer it towards the end if that's okay um so as i was saying we after the um i i I realized that there's so much information out there and so much noise and so much to read and absorb and understand that it can be really overwhelming um, for an organization. And if you've got a, a team that doesn't have a dedicated internal communications resource uh, and, of, you know, and it's, it's part of someone's role or you kind of, you're kind of self-sufficient and you're doing it yourself, it can be a bit much to know where to start and where it ends and what, what you need to do. So I created, um, three pillars if you want to call, if you want to call them that uh, reset recover and revive and i encourage people to address each pillar at a time um, so you can kind of plan out what what you need to say and how it works so reset is all about what where are we as a business where are we what are we doing what's happened in during this crisis have we've lost any clients have we gained new clients have we have we survived this are we not surviving this where where are our um, what are our new objectives? Do we have to have a new vision? And this is the conversation that you need to have with some of your senior partners in the business to ensure that they are also contributing to, to the conversation. Uh, some organizations have thrived in this crisis and they have really kind of been inundated with work and they have had to have they've had other challenges to take on that. So they had to bring people on board really quickly. Other organizations have struggled. Uh, and struggle to maintain clients and, and some organizations have managed to maintain which is you know great uh, but it does mean that all all organizations should be sitting down together with core teams and having a conversation about what does this now mean for our future and how are we going to manage our our objectives and goals and performance because ultimately survival is going to be key here and in order for people to keep their roles and, and keep producing work, you need to keep making money if you're being really blunt about you know, what, what we're about as a business. So it's about making sure that you reset and you're right at the beginning and you're having those conversations and everyone's aligned with the messaging and are on the same page. Alongside this in the reset phase, I would recommend that if you haven't already, you put together a team, the BTW, the back to work team or back to workplace team where you'd have people who are not necessarily uh, senior leaders, because it doesn't need to be, it, it, can, it needs to be someone who um, 
who uh, has, has an element of influence but also has decision making abilities but, and, and also knows what's happening. So this team would consist of somebody from HR potentially, somebody from facilities, uh, a senior exec sponsor who, who can sign off anything that, you know, that's been agreed. You'd have somebody from um, a, a finance, you know, uh, any uh, an operation, different divisions. Look at your look at the layer of your organisation and, and decide. Actually, we need a representative from these this kind of environment. Currently, at the moment, if you haven't started taking bringing people back into the workplace, your priority probably is understanding the layout of the office and how you can maintain social distancing and how people are going to how people are going to work. In the new environment so you might need to do, spend a lot of time with your back to workplace team looking at the facilities and the office layout and, and where, if you're sharing an office building with other uh, other organizations well you'll have a facilities manager looking after the entire building so making sure that they are involved externally as a third party so they can support you uh, with any screen coverings and any any spacing that you need to put on the floor the government's messaging is confusing and I don't think any of us can say that it isn't because it, you know the two meter rule the one meter rule how, how we should be situated and my advice to to organizations is go above and beyond what they're recommending in my in my view because the safety of your employees is number one priority and making sure that your team know that you are looking after their best interest is really important uh, so also in this reset phase you will be looking at potentially sending out pulse check surveys uh, and what i mean by pulse check surveys is um, mini temperature checks about how people are feeling currently um, so you'd have no more than probably four or five questions and you'd be asking questions such as how do you feel right now? How do you feel about coming into work? What's your current situation like? Are you comfortable in being back into the workplace? Um, and there's other questions which I'll share with Victoria that she can send out to you after this webinar that you might want to consider. But these questions will just give you an idea as an organization on how your people are feeling. Uh, and you can make sure that you've got your frequently asked questions document ready on your shared um, space so if you've got an intranet put it on your internet space if you're communicating via whatsapp uh, then put it on your whatsapp group um, just so people know that you are considering every single kind of scenario as where possible um, you can obviously make assumptions on what people are concerned about by the conversation that your leaders may be having with their teams so i'd also encourage your leadership team to uh, feed back um, to to um, to a, to a dedicated person so whether that's back to the work back to the workplace team or you've got a dedicated person allocated to uh, capture the questions being asked and fight building the responses uh, but just make sure that sorry victoria no no go on let, I'll, i'm going to jump in when you finish what you're about to say i'm just going to say just make sure that uh, it's it's clear on who this individual or who this team is so people know where to go so they're not you know fluffing about looking for where to go because they're, they're busy enough so that's what you need to just consider yeah, I mean, all I was all I was going to say was about the um, the so the pulse checks, obviously, which I think are a, you know it's such a basic, cheap, easy to implement idea, isn't it? That that and you know the, the feedback that you're going to get from that is going to be really really valuable. So I wanted to pick up on that, and then I also wanted to pick up on what you said um, about assumptions and um, sort of slightly later. But you know the the and also actually what you were saying about the PPE and you know going above and beyond because you know as a as a business as an organisation. Um, you want to be this is this seems to me to be such an important time you know when our teams are all disparate everybody kind of has their own challenges and um, you know some of the challenges that some of our teams have will resonate with us personally but others we won't necessarily be able to empathize with because they might not just be within our kind of immediate sphere of um, understanding so i think you know this idea that we do need to go above and beyond and that we do need to be listening is really important but then i think and i think we agree on this but then the really really important bit is what you do next isn't it so you know yeah. if somebody does have a concern if somebody doesn't want to come back to work if somebody physically can't come back to work because you know they're shielding or a member of their family is shielding or they have kids and there's no school available um or you know whatever the whatever the reasons are and i mean they might it might not be that they don't want to come back to work their, their issue might be might be something else say um but once you understand that and once you know, you have to act, don't you, as a leader? You have to deal with that. Without a doubt. I mean, if you're going to ask people questions on how they're feeling, but then don't respond to their to their answers, then you're just going to lose that trust. 
and and the trust is a big this is such a big thing at the moment that because trust everywhere else is being depleted so people are not trusting the media for example with the news that they're sharing the trust in the government has gone downhill a little bit a recent uh, i think we spoke about it recently in victoria about the edelman trust barometer uh, yeah. and edelman uh, does a uh, an annual they do an annual survey about trust but they did a covid 19 one uh, and, and and surveyed uh, thousands of employees and employers across the globe about trust and how people are feeling right now and the trust in employers is is at a, one of the you know highest it's been for a while so people are looking at you for supporting them and answering their, their worries and, and leading them uh, in the right way. So if you're asking questions and you're asking them how they're feeling and they're telling you quite honestly and being quite transparent about how they're feeling, not responding to that is going to deplete that trust without a doubt. And I think even if you, and I say this to everybody, that even if the answer is not what they want to hear, or even if you don't know what the answer is, then just be honest and say, I don't know what the answer to that question is right now, but I'm going to go and find out what that is. Uh, and once you found out and it isn't what they want to hear, then explain why. You know, this we can't do that at the moment because it's really important that you need to be in the workplace for this for this particular client because they want to have this conversation. And and in, and, and it's a why. And we say this all the time. But if you don't explain the why behind your reasoning and your rationale, people will not believe what you're telling them and they'll think it's self for selfish reasons or you don't care about them so 100 percent, you know make sure that you are answering the questions and you go back to people within a sufficient time frame as well don't hang on for you know for, for weeks on a question go keep going back and updating them that you're you're, you're getting the answer as soon as it comes away you'll, you'll let them know yeah and just to um just to end on that point obviously before we move on to the sort of recover um pillar the um the other thing, and, and again, we talked about this yesterday, and I, I still think it's really relevant, is, um, you know, it's all very well and good for us to be kind of talk about all the things that um, leaders should be doing for employers, uh, sorry, employees, but we have to acknowledge, don't we, that there's a line, you know, there is a line to be drawn between, you know, what is reasonable employer behaviour, what is reasonable employee behaviour, and where you know, where we where we come up against that line, and obviously that's that's, you know, you then move into a sort of HR uh, situation and, and possibly, I mean, obviously internal comms is still relevant at that point, but we need to acknowledge that, don't we? That it isn't all on the employee here. So it isn't all on the employer here. Yeah. There's a yeah. there's a mutual there's a mutuality here of, of requirements, isn't there? Oh yeah. I mean, there will be people who will take the absolute piss. I'm not, you know, excuse my French, but they will be taking it all the way to another level in terms of um, using this to their advantage. And this is, you know, and it doesn't mean that performance management goes out the window here. You still need to make sure that you are doing your performance management, but in a, but taking on, on board the fact what their performance was like pre-COVID, you know, were they high performers, were they develop, you know, de delivering great work, were they, you know, did they ever drop the ball, you know, things like that. And if they didn't, and they are now, then this is when you need to be a bit sympathetic to the to what's going on in their lives and asking them that you know honestly like is everything okay can i support with everything if you've had an employee that's continuously been letting you down and not delivering work and is doing even and using covid19 now as a bit of an excuse this is where you may need to have those uncomfortable conversations and be a bit courageous about right okay look we need to sort this out because you haven't delivered what we need to deliver and we've given you plenty of opportunity to have this you know have an open transparent conversation with us so we may need to put on a performance management plan and there's nothing wrong with that and that's when you're right uh, victoria hr need to come in and support you with this conversation um don't don't think that just because um we are going through a, a massive crisis and everything like that that people can't do anything you know they shouldn't be doing it they won't do any work they, they need to keep delivering work at the end of the day but be reasonable obviously with what you're asking them to do and make sure that you're having that conversation there will be things going on behind the scenes that you may not be aware of so as long as you've done your due diligence and you've asked the questions and you've given them opportunities and you've acknowledged that not everybody will be at 100 percent performance you know ask, ask them what's acceptable you know give them a task list that says this is this is what i need to deliver is this acceptable will this work with your time frame if not what do we need to take away what do i need to do to help you deliver this a little bit more um if somebody's still not 
played the ball or are doing what they need them to do, then you need to kind of take it up as level. Uh, and that's really important to bear that in mind. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, and, and you will have people like that, sadly, who will take advantage a little bit. Um, but on the other side, do do be considerate that they may have stuff going on in their personal lives that you may not be aware of, but make sure that they have an opportunity to share that. It may not be with you, so you, they may not want to share it with you, that's fine. Then make sure that you've got stuff in place where they can go and speak quite openly. So you may have an employee assistance program where people can access information that you, that you, you know, like mental health helplines or counselling or whatever. Or you might have a mentoring program in, in your in your organisation. You might have mental health first aiders, uh, diversity ambassadors, whatever you've got going on in your in your organisation. Make sure that these colleagues know the route to go and have this this conversation. Or they may want to chat with HR, and that's fine. Uh, but as long as they're having that conversation. Well, yeah, no, great. So we move on to recover. Yeah. So once you kind of once you know the lay of the land and what the future holds and your horizons, um, this is when the internal communication strategy would come into place. Now, conscious that some of you may not have a dedicated internal comm strategy, and that's fine. You could, it, it's all about making sure that you, you could do something as simple as a page and a plan. Just and this is really important because if you don't have a plan. That tells you what the key messages are and what you want your leadership team and your employees to communicate then there's a risk that messages will be uh, mixed up and misinformation and gossip may, may take over so again I'll, i'm going to share with victoria after this webinar a, a template that you can use um, to to help you kind of decipher what those messages will be um, and here is when you will be talking looking at your stakeholder map again like who are your key stakeholders have they you know what, what are they what what do you need to communicate with them how do you need to communicate them communicate with them what's your channels matrix and basically your channels matrix and you may you know you may not need one that's you know detailed but it, it's just a case of even jotting down on a, on a document to say these, these are our channels, so this is how we communicate with people, and this is this is what we say to them. This is what we say to these people through these channels, and that will be that will give you an indication of where your gaps are in your comms as well, and where people are being left behind. And when I to talk about people being left behind, you may not have considered with with the busyness of what's been going on, you may have forgotten about those people who, who potentially on maternity leave who in, in normal circumstance would have had keeping in touch meetings on a regular basis, would have been coming into the office to, to, meet, uh, to, to meet you as a, as a, to find out where they're up to. People are long-term sick, people are on annual leave. Those individuals sometimes can be miss off key change programs and what's going on in the business. So making sure that you cover that. And also people, and I, and I don't think this will be the case in any of your law firms, but there may be individuals who don't access um, their emails on a regular basis. Um, if, they're, if they're busy with client work um, and behavior, you know, if they've got other stuff going on as well. So you might want to think, how do we make sure that they're getting the news? Or it could be the other way where you're, everything that you're doing is very email heavy. So key, urgent, important messages are being lost uh, in, that, in, that, um, in those communication channels as well. So your matrix will just give you an indication of where the gaps are. So you might want to, it'll also tell you what's working and what isn't working. So if you're doing newsletters, are people reading them? Are they actioning anything that's in those newsletters? Are people turning up to your senior partners, town halls that you might be doing on a monthly basis? If they're turning up, what, are they, what do they think about them? So this is where you kind of look at the, this is where you kind of look at your, your offering and your key messaging and what you're saying and where you want and, and what you want people to understand about your values and the objectives and your mission and your vision of, of the business. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of makes a little bit of sense. So once you've done your kind of key messaging and people know the direction you are going with your communications and, and, and where they can get this information and where the single source of truth is for this information as well, that's when you can eventually move into revive. Um, and the revive pillar is where you can start building and um, and, and, and empowering your colleagues uh, and building engagement uh, and getting them into um, into somewhere where they feel they can be innovative with ideas and thoughts and almost back to kind of 100% if you, if you want to kind of get there because you would have hopefully by this point put things in practice um, that has enabled them to feel like they're being listened to, they are being cared for, they have the right tools and technology in place to give to make sure that they're staying connected 
with the organisation. So if you've decided that a lot of your a lot of your employees are going to be working from home, they're making sure that they've got the technology to continue that connection with the people who may be in their workplace. So, um, so just um, just going back a step then. So um, back to recover. So um, well, back to reset really. So reset is understanding where we are, kind of fourteen weeks in from the start of lockdown. What's going on? What's our kind of plan? Our survival plan? Our, our growth plan? Our um, our, our business plan, I suppose. You know, we're going to look at, we're going to relook at our business plan, and we're going to work out how to go for how to go forwards. Now, yeah. obviously, we know that for the past past fourteen weeks, for the first probably month, maybe up to six weeks, it was kind of panic and survival, yeah. and it was quite difficult to get out of that stage, wasn't it? And I think then, for most, for the majority of law firms that I know, um, so May was probably kind of the toughest month. I think May was May was very difficult. You know, April was kind of okay with billings because yep. there was work you could sort of finish off and work that was ongoing, but nothing really came in that was new in April, which meant obviously in May you had a real dip in terms of billing. I think June started to pick up, um, not for not obviously for every area, and also that that May situation wouldn't have been the same for everybody, particularly not in the kind of areas that we're seeing growth and. Um, you know areas that kind of haven't haven't really changed haven't been affected so like copter protection would, would be one um so that's kind of what happened in the first 14 weeks so then recover is all about right we look back at what's happened but we also kind of look forward to see to see where we're going and what you're saying is if i'm if i'm correct and correct me if i'm wrong is that as you're doing that you mustn't forget about what you're telling your staff you know that yeah. needs to be a real part and part and parcel of, of that plan and i'm assuming and correct me if i'm wrong that the the idea of, of the of the matrix, for example, is to really look at what um, what your channels for internal comms are. So, what are you doing at the minute? What have you done historically to engage with your staff over and above kind of sitting down with them, um, for example? Which is fine. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with sitting down with your staff and talking to them. It's pr probably the most effective in some ways. Um, yeah. <laughs> So it's understanding how you've historically done it and then trying to work out if those channels are still effective. Is that right? Yeah. And it's about, and, and, and that would be a channel, by the way, that face-to-face -face conversation. That is definitely something that should be on that matrix. So yeah. there'll be things like what's worked for you, what's worked well pre-COVID, what's worked during COVID and what's working well now. And then there'll be things that you don't need to do anymore because when COVID hit, crisis mode was initiated and people were doing daily briefings, weekly briefings, newsletters, video diaries, all sorts of like high level comms to make sure that people were being kept informed about what's happening. Now, as we're moving into the recovery phase in terms of going back into the workplace, not recovery from COVID-19 by any stretch, but me going to back workplace. What is it that we now need to kind of step back from a little bit and what do we need to amplify more? You know, what are people, and this is where your pulse check that you hopefully have implemented or the questions that you are asking your staff, uh, if you decide not to do the traditional kind of pulse check, so you might want to just do uh, a conversation and you might give your leaders a set of questions, two or three, that they need to ask when they do their check-ins with their with the colleagues on a weekly basis. Once you've got that information, that will give you a sense of what is working and what isn't working and where your gaps are in your communication channels and in your communication in general. You might discover when you look at your matrix, sorry, um, that actually we're, we're doing okay and we've covered every kind of area where possible we're communicating on a frequent basis but not overwhelming and we're making and all our key messages what we need people to understand are being covered off so we've got awareness we've got understanding we've got inform um you know and the key thing of all of this is ensuring that you've got a two-way communication channel in place because everything might be very heavily broadcast um, and it's fine to a certain extent, especially when it's crisis, you want that leadership kind of, you know, this is what we're doing and you don't necessarily want to have too many kind of chit chats because you just need to get what's going on out into the business. But now we're in this kind of two way conversation and you need to make sure that people have a channel where they can feed back how they are feeling. So that might be as simple as having just a dedicated email address that people can email any concerns or questions that they might have. Or you might have a dedicated person who is looking after uh, Q and A's and questions and things like that. So just making sure that you've got like two way engagement in that process as well. And your comm strategy. Um, so you might want to have a dedicated internal comms one, or you might just want to have a generic in communication strategy, which covers PR and internal. Because everything, the rest of those areas should align. So whatever you're telling people externally uh, should also be being told internally. So your messages should always be aligned with your customers 
shouldn't know any more than your employees. They yeah. either know a little yeah. bit less or your or your employee or they're on equal par with what, what's been told. None of your employees should be picking up the paper and reading what's going on in the business before you've told them. Uh, and yeah. that's where yeah. it's, it's really important that you, you bear that in mind because you'll lose, you know, you'll lose that trust again. And trust is the key thing that will get you through this crisis. Um, and, and, and people won't, you know, good people won't leave then. Um, and that's what, and that's retention is going to be a big thing here because, you know, law firms, the, the, your, your lawyers are, are like great people who have worked hard to get to where they are. And there's no doubt there's competition out there for great lawyers and, and great people. So you want to make sure that you, you retain your staff and you retain good people and you don't lose them uh, just because you're not communicating with them properly. Um, and you can only really do revive uh, once you've got all that in place. So the reward and recognition. You know, those kind of things are really important. And I don't mean reward in terms of monetary. I mean reward in terms of, you, you know, you're doing a good job and acknowledging that and appreciating the work that people are doing and sharing those stories and talking quite openly about great work people have done. Because, um, you know, it's been a bit doom and gloom. I'm not going to lie. It's been really gloomy over the last few, few months. And not only with COVID-19, but everything that's going on with race relations and you know equality diversity and inclusion the black lives matter movement all of that's been really emotional and you're going to have people in your organization who have been impacted severely by what's been happening not only with covid19 but also with the black lives matter movement um, and they're going to feel a little bit disengaged a bit lost a, a little bit unheard worried you know and if you look at the, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's common that there are not many black, Asian, minority ethnic people in the law industry. So, you know, the ones who do have will probably be the minority in your organisation. So it's about making sure that they are being heard. And the recent report that came out from the government that demonstrates that people who are BAME, uh, Bangladeshi and black people in particular, are more at risk of COVID-19. So there'll be some worries that they will have themselves about what does that mean for me and do, do I need to am I risking not only myself but my family's life but by getting onto that bus so it's about looking at your flexible working policies and talking to them on a on a on an equal footing to say look if you if that's worrying you then maybe you start a bit later on if, if you need them in the office that is or, or you you can finish a bit later on and having that negotiation and, and being mindful of that and not being scared of having those conversations with people to say yeah, you know how are you feeling you I was going to I was going to ask you about that because I think um, I, th I think the I mean it's it's completely wrong that this would be you know that it would be an issue but I do I do wonder sometimes if if people if people in leadership would prefer not to talk about those things because they find it uncomfortable which is obviously completely the wrong way the wrong way of dealing with it it's not dealing with it is it it's just brushing it under the table but you know. Are there any are there any lessons there? Are there is there a sort of a best practice that, um, that 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 leaders can sort of look to or can apply, or is it just common sense? Is it just being sensible? It's just being, you know, it's about the no one is going to begrudge you by asking a question, and it's been, you know, and, and and having those uncomfortable conversations really important to make sure that the people are being heard. And there's no, you know, there's no framework, there's no model, there's no magic pill that will give you the answers, or, or will even make, you know, make it easier for you. It won't, and it is uncomfortable. And if you're a, you know, and especially if you're a white man working in a, in an industry that's majority white, it is uncomfortable for you because. You, there's no, I, I guess I'm going to assume that you might be feeling a little bit attacked and you might be feeling a bit stereotyped and you're thinking, well, if I ask this question, they're going to think I'm being a bit awkward or a bit difficult. But all people want to be treated is that people want to be treated fairly and they want to be treated equally and they want to have the opportunity to be heard. And if you don't know how to address something or you're not quite sure how people want to be, with, you know, because uh, people say to me that, oh, I don't know what the right PC term is now. The world's gone PC mad. I don't know whether I should say black or can I say people of colour or am I allowed to even say ethnic minority? You know, my, my, my response back to that is ask them, ask people, you know, ask, ask people, how do you, how do you like, you know, how, if you have to reference their colour, you know, there's very, very, very small um, conversations where you'd have to refer, reference anyone by their colour of their skin. But if it's really kind of, if you're really interested and you're really intrigued about the, general referencing points and ask people, ask your colleagues, ask, ask the people that you work with, like, what's the right terminology? Educate yourself, you know, learn. There's lots of information out there. There shouldn't really be, there shouldn't really be an excuse not to, not to have that conversation. And it will be very cringe and very uncomfortable at times. Um, but people really appreciate it. And 
it's about calling out poor behavior as well right and i think when you get into that if you want people to be driven and you want people to be high performing and you want them to contribute to the success of the business then you need to be giving them the opportunity to do so and by be equal and fair and, and that's across the board that's with women that's with lgbtq plus community that's with black people you know that's across all the kind of diverse groups that you might have in your organization and just being conscious of that uh, of, of what's going on in the business um so yeah so that's that's where the kind of revive section would be so don't forget about appreciation don't forget about you know recognizing good work um making sure that people have a voice and they can be innovative and bring them in onto those conversations you know so if you if you've got a problem who better to help you solve that problem but the people who are doing it every single day of their lives so bring them in let's have a conversation and let's be innovative and give them that power uh, to, to 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 you know bring make them part of the business because that's how the business will succeed um so yeah so hopefully that that answers that that pillar properly um so i just quickly want to cover off this culveros change curve um because this is completely my favorite think, bit here, you know <laughs> oh it's just you know what i love i love referencing this curve because it's um it, it just gives people it, it allows people to understand why certain individuals may be behaving the way they are behaving in in the business because you said right at the beginning of this webinar uh, victoria that some people you might think oh my god what's the problem what's going on here why can't they just get with the program and this is why they can't get with the program so culver ross change curve was actually developed by a, a lady called elizabeth culver ross in the 50s and she created this because um initially to deal with grief and how you how people deal with grief in their in their lives and i would i would say that what we have all gone through in the last few months has definitely been grief uh grief either um for the life that we've lost before or the things that are going on in our business or things that might happen in our in our, in our um in our own personal and professional circumstance so what mm -hmm. into internal comms and in change communications in particular we reference the culver ross model quite a lot because when we implement change it generally means that people are kind of going through a grief cycle themselves because they'll be up so if you look at this at the beginning you know people will be in shock and they'll be in denial and they'll be angry um, and they'll be i can't believe this is not that is happening this is just not fair i've worked so hard to get here why is this happening to me and this is why that reset phase that i spoke about at the beginning the reset pillar is so important because you need to make sure that you are addressing some of these worries and these this this kind of this belief that is happening to them and you'll and you'll have people who are just not going to engage with what you're saying either because they're just going to be like oh it, you know if, if we take COVID-19 as an example you might have people in your organization that are saying it's fake it's not new it's just a flu you know why are people going over the top about it and you'll have people who are like I can't believe this is happening to me and what have I done you know and, and really anxious about it so you'll have people kind of all over the kind of curve then once you've kind of accepted that this is life now and this is what's going on, this is when you will you will spot where mental health plays a big part here. And this is where some people will 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 be edging on depression uh, and feeling like, well, what's the point of me working? So you'll find this with people who are potentially um, parenting, you know, homeschooling at home, have got other worries with their elderly parents or with with family members who may be unwell, uh, and they're just like at a low point in 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 their kind of world. Um, and this is where the recovery pillar would would comes in 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 where, where you move into this part where you'd be looking at your key messaging what you're telling your colleagues what you're telling your employees how are you making sure that they can come out of this depression phase and and have something to look forward to uh and, you know and helping them come out of that and, and accepting the fact that you will have people in this dip for a while um, you can go and backwards then, can't you as well you as go well back as well. up and down yeah this is the thing so you'll have a you'll have a handful of people in depression you'll have still have people in your shock anger denial phase you know they will be like i am it'll take a while for them to shift into that roller coaster and go down there uh, and then you'll also have people who are quite resilient uh, a little bit more resilient than others uh, in terms of that they've already, already gone into problem solving uh, and what happens here is that those people who are in problem solving uh, sometimes you find are struggling with the guys who are in still in the shock and the denial phase and when you work, look in your organization and you're a bit like why are people not getting with the program here and these are the people who will feel the frustration so the guys who are in the problem solving phase and are already in revive and appreciation 
they're, they're over it. away they're looking ahead <laughs> they're looking ahead they're over it they're looking forward they're, they're probably excited about the future because it's brought a bit of change and yeah. it's invigorated them and some people thrive in a crisis so you find that a lot of introverts who have been you know struggling with uh, uh, s- certain situations in the past where they can't you know accept you know that they're a bit not negative at all, but sometimes, you know, the, the, the thinkers and the reflectors, you'll find that they come out in their own here because they've thought about the future and thought, how can we make this work for them? Um, so, you know, there will be people, so what the idea of this curve is to kind of give you guys an idea that there will be people in your organisation who are all over this curve. And you might have somebody who is in problem solving and really excited and ready to knock out the park and then something happens in their life either professionally or personally that takes them right back into depression or even further back up the curve into anger um and and to kind of accept the fact and what this where people use this curve and where i kind of encourage some of my clients to use it is when they're having that conversation with people so when you're talking to your colleague to say where do you where do you sit on this curve like where if, if like right now where are you and this is a bit of like a tool to kind of help you understand where they are. So you'll get some people going, actually, I'm in bargaining. So I, I, I feel like there's something we can do. We may not need to put those redundancies in place at the moment, or we may not need to change our mission. You know, I feel like we can do more yet. And or I'm actually in acceptance, or actually, I'm not feeling that great. And this kind of gives you an idea to plot where your team are at the moment yeah. in terms of yeah. how they're feeling there's lots of information on the Culber Ross model um, online if, you, if you're really interested in it but the idea of this is to just just to be aware that not every employee in the organization will be coming along that journey with you so you might have the best messaging you'll have the absolutely fantastic tools in place you know your leaders are doing what they need to be doing and they're having those conversations but sometimes it'll take some people a bit longer to get there so just be conscious of that and make sure you've got the right tactics in place to help people who are in these kind of buckets uh, on there as well. Uh, I was talking about this yesterday, didn't we? there's a, an amazing um, podcast by Renee Brown um, and she talks to a guy who worked with Elizabeth Culberos. Um, I forgot his name, his name's David something, I can't remember his name, but he, he's a grief specialist. And yeah. he talks about yeah. six step actually, which is which is brilliant. So if you're interested in this a little bit more and you're interested in, in, in kind of understanding change and how to manage this, then I recommend that you listen to uh, that Brene Brown's podcast and also um, read Brene Brown's book or that's called Dare to Lead um, because that's an amazing book that kind of explains about shame and vulnerability and how as leaders you can um, get the best out of your people by just changing your language. Uh, and the way you might speak uh, to to your colleagues in in the organisation. So yeah, so that's the end of, hopefully that was useful to to everyone. Uh, I will be sharing these resources and and, and some of my templates with Victoria so you've got that access because I don't want to kind of leave you guys kind of like scrabbling around looking for information, so you'll have that. So I'll make sure that Victoria, you get that. Uh, I don't know if you've got any questions. And just before the um, just before any questions come in, um, just just um, we've we've got to a point with every single one of the seven webinars that we've done so far, and I feel like we're at that point now um, where we've talked about you know everything that's happened is one of the and maybe I'm just coming out of the uh, the grief curve I don't know, but um, one one of the things that, that sort of occurs to me every single time is you know despite everything that's happening with internal comms and with everything else we've talked about you know this is an opportunity isn't it if you haven't been good or as good as you could have been at internal internal comms in the past or if there are areas that you know that you feel like as a leader you've really struggled um during covid and during lockdown this is an opportunity isn't it this is your chance to improve yeah yeah gosh yeah you know there's there, this is the right this is it's like almost having a blank piece of paper and going right we know we haven't been brilliant at our internal cons before we know we haven't done what we were meant to have done because you know when you grow organically or you've you things get in the way and client work gets in the way and things are happening and things are working fine you know there's nothing really going wrong in your organization you're attracting great talent you're retaining staff you're doing a good job you know, there's, there's nothing kind of stopping you thinking we're, 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 you know, if it ain't broke, let's not fix it kind of method. But I think what might have happened now is when COVID hit and lockdown happened, a lot of individuals, a lot of businesses realised that they didn't have the tools or the comms in place to have that conversation and to have those, um, to, to allow people to know what was happening. So a lot of people ended up scrabbling around looking for 
the right tool or the right technique or the right key messaging um, and, the, and, and an internal comms person to kind of support with some of those messaging because it's really important that you do have a trusted advisor in your business that understands behaviors and languages and can work with your HR team and your chief executives and your senior partners so they, they can give you a heads up of what's happening in the business and, and, and what your people are saying. Um, so it's definitely the, the time, I would say, you know, a blank piece of paper, doing an audit, you know, doing an audit in terms of asking, looking at, you're getting someone, either you can, if you've got the resources, do it in-house, amazing, do it in-house. If you need to bring somebody in, then bring somebody in. But looking at your channels, what what value are they bringing? What are people saying about them? What 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 do people think about them? And what what what's the return on investment on them? And what's the outcome? We haven't really spoken about measurement in this because it's just it's a bit too much to go on, go on an hour's webinar. But looking at your measure, you know, looking at your outcomes and and the measures that you have in place and the impact that's having, because ultimately everything that we do has to go back to the business objectives and return on investment and the money that it's making. To be blunt, you know, you shouldn't really be doing anything in the business that's not adding value. Yeah. Um, so those kind of measures in place and understanding not only the output, so it's, it's all right saying 70% of the people read this comms, but what, so what, you know, why, why are they reading that? What are they doing with it? What are the behavior changes and what impact is it having? Yeah. Well, that's it, isn't it? You know, um, going back to that, um, going back to that point on kind of, um, you know, business objectives and, you know, delivering value, you know, for the majority of us, our business relies on the people that do the delivery. So yes, of course, um, internal comms needs to have value, but if you just simply link it, link it back to, are your staff happy? And if they're not happy, are you measuring that? And are you doing something about it? Then if to start with, you know, you don't know if they're happy. And then by the time you've done a bit more sort of more detailed strategic internal comms and you find out that they're not happy. And then after that, you can work out how to make them happier. You know, if that's resulting in, in staff staying longer and being more engaged, in doing a better mm. job because they understand and, you know, the most of them. I, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. And, and, I, and I have a, a, not a problem with happy at all, uh, but I, I do think happiness is really subjective. And as an employer, you can't always be in control of, of an individual's happiness. But what you can be in control of is if they have engaged and they feel empowered and they're, hurt and they're being listened. Because when you, and, and I, and there's a debate and a lot of people disagree with me on it and that's and that's fine but when you put that pressure on you to make a colleague happy it's it's it, it you know it, it's an impossible task i would say because it's so subjective and people have so many different things going in their lives what i would focus on more than happiness is are my employees feeling empowered and engaged and are they delivering and, and, the, and the result of that would be, are they delivering good results and are they doing good work without actually crashing and burning? And that's yeah. where I would focus that kind of, it, it, it's more about the engaged side. They may be miserable, they may be hating life, they might be you know, grumpy and not wanting to have any kind of conversation, but if they're, if they're feeling empowered enough to deliver great work and they're, and they're knocking out of the park every time, they don't need to be like high-fiving and having the best time of their life, it doesn't matter. That, that's you know it'd be great if they did it'd be great if they were engaged in that way but sounds like a typical happy, PR agency <laughs> so yeah so happiness is, is something that is quite subjective so I would say you know let, let's let's look at are your people empowered and are they engaged and are they delivering great work uh, if not why not and that's where you kind of need to start right from the basics yeah Perfect. Well, we haven't um, we haven't got any questions, um, but if anybody has got a last question they want to sort of sneak in before we um, before we head off, then absolutely feel free to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I can't see that we're going to get any questions because I think people will put them down if they were going to already. Yeah, I mean, if anybody does think of anything that they want any um, support or advice on internal comms, or they've got any questions, or they've got any like personal worries, and I am on LinkedIn, so do do seek me out on LinkedIn, and obviously go through Victoria as well because we're connected, uh, and I will share some extra resources because I know it's a lot to take in, it's a lot of information to listen to in the last fifty or so minutes. So I'll make sure that resources, links, any interesting links that I've I've seen that might be of interest, particularly to law firms, uh, I'll make sure that Victoria has that as a resource pack for you guys so she can send out to you and, you and you can read it in your own time but please do you know do do get in touch and and, and feel free to ask any questions about the matrix matrixes or the in, the comm strategies and things like that and we'll, you know we want to try and help you as much as we possibly can fab well that's um, that's really generous thank you um and yes as you said we will um, we'll send that out along with um a recording of um, the webinar just in case um you know your colleagues are interested and obviously will come 
but yeah just to wrap up by saying thank you so much that was really insightful and i can't believe how much we've actually managed to cover in 57 minutes <laughs> <laughs> so thank you you're welcome it's been brilliant and thank you so much for asking me to be here today it's been uh, it's been fascinating so thanks no and thanks for your questions thanks ever so much thanks everybody for coming thank you everyone thanks bye